a very good afternoon to all those who have connected with us today and uh, i am very happy to welcome you all to the 88th uh, continuing medica medical education event organized by the faculty of medicine bioscience and nursing masai university today we have our in house speaker associate professor mohammad mohammad rahal yusuf and uh, currently uh, prof rahal is the associate professor of medicine and uh, he heads the unit there and uh, of masai university and he is also a chairman of the society of cardiac imaging malaysia and chairman of the data committee national heart association of malaysia asean society of echocardiography uh, he is a chairperson and uh, he he had been a chairperson from 2018 2020 and uh, he is a immediate past chairman 2020 2022 and um, something about his educational background uh, prof rahal uh, did his undergraduation in uh, medical science in 1994 uh, he graduated from the university of st andrews and his mbchb uh, in from university of manchester united kingdom and um, he uh, of course he has done his mrcp uh, in 2000 and he is um he's done his certification in he's a certified trainer from the national heart association of malaysia echocardiography uh, so he has completed his certification in 2013 and prof rahal started his academic career only in 2019 where he joined as associate professor of masai university here but before that he had been working as cardiologist in uh, various um, hospitals in malaysia to list some of them uh, he had been a clinical specialist in cardiology uh, national heart institute kuala lumpur and uh, a cardiologist uh, there as well you know in hospital serdang uh, malaysia and specialist in general internal medicine hospital kuala lumpur Uh, from 2011 to 2015 and he had been a specialist in general uh, internal medicine uh, hospital ampang uh, malaysia from uh, 2015 to 2016 and he had been a consultant physician hospital sungai bolo and uh, consultant consultant physician and non invasive uh, cardiology columbia asia hospitals from 2017 to 2019 uh, and a visiting consulting uh, physician even now uh, at uh, columbia asia hospital um, and uh, yeah so that's a long experience uh, in in clinical practice and um, prof rahal um, is is so much interested uh, in cardiac imaging echocardiography cardiac ct valvular heart disease cardio oncology and acute coronary syndrome um and these are his special interest areas i think i will not uh, delay much uh, on on reading his cv so i would like to request prof rahal who is going to give us a talk today uh, on um, uh, update on heart failure the new guidelines prof over to you okay. prof okay uh, thank you uh, uh, madam chairperson and thank you for everybody that has uh, you know dedicated their time to listen to my talk and thank you for the organizers for organizing this meet so i'm actually going to talk to you about heart failure the new american college of cardiology and american heart association guidelines we're going to do some comparisons with the european society of cardiology guidelines and what importantly is that we need to do what we need to do for our patients so we can have the guidelines but we need to implement the guidelines and how are we going to do that so the new universal definition of heart failure uh, was published last year so this is the first uh, where it uh, puts all the different definitions previously to one common definition so we called it symptoms and or signs of heart failure caused by a structural or a functional cardiac abnormality and corroborated by at least one of the following uh elevated natural active peptide levels so uh we would actually recommend n terminal pro bmp and objective evidence of cardiogenic pulmonary or systemic congestion by diagnostic modalities or hemodynamic measure at rest or sometimes in patients with preserved ejection fraction we will have to do it on exercise so with provocation so we divide uh 
uh, heart failure into different categories based on the uh, measurements of cardiac imaging of the ejection fraction. Uh, so the first one is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Uh, these are patients with a left ventricular ejection fraction of less or equal than 40. And then we have this new entity called heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction, MREF. Uh, previously, it is uh, called as mid-range, but now we think that because uh, phenotypically, they actually uh, behave like a heart failure with reduced, so we call it mildly reduced. And these are patients with left ventricular ejection fraction in the range of 41 to 49 percent. And the next category is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, uh, so we call them HEF-PEF, uh, and they are patients with a left ventricular ejection fraction of more than 50 percent. And then there's a new category here called heart failure with improved ejection fraction. These are patients with baseline ejection fraction of less than 40 percent and upon uh, you know starting them on guideline medication therapy there is an increase in the ejection fraction of more than 10 points and the second measurement of ejection fraction is actually more than 40 percent so they have improved in their ejection fraction we also recognize that there are patients who are in the MEF ref group, so MREF, the mildly reduced, which also have an improved ejection fraction to more than 50%. And we also categorize these patients uh, as heart failure with improved EF. So this is based on the universal definition. However, when we see the guidelines, uh, there is some uh, uh, difference of opinion uh, in this area. So this is the new 2022 AHAACC Heart Failure uh, Society of America guidelines on the management of heart failure. This actually has just come out two weeks ago today, so it's uh, hot off the press. Okay, so uh, first of all, I just uh, will go through. They have uh, categorized stages of heart failure. So we have stage A, B, C, and D. Stage A are patients at risk of heart failure. These are patients, they do not have any cardiac abnormality, either structurally or functionally at this point in time, but they have risk factors for heart failure like hypertension, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity. They have been exposed to cardiotoxic agents from their uh, cancer treatment, uh, genetic variants of cardiomyopathy. They might have family history of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy and things like that. But they have no overt uh, uh, changes on their echocardiogram or no overt symptoms at all. So we call them at risk. And the second stage B is pre-heart failure. So these are patients who have got structural abnormalities or abnormal hemodynamics in the heart, but they do not have symptoms of heart failure. So they might have risk factors of increase in the measured natriuretic peptide or even persistent elevated cardiac troponin, but they are asymptomatic. Uh, so they are in this stage B, which we call pre-heart failure. So when we echo them, they might have ejection fraction of about 40% or 42% or 45%, but they're asymptomatic. The ones that we see in clinic or at the emergency department are patients with symptomatic heart failure, which is stage C. These are patients with current and or previous symptoms of heart failure, and they have come and uh, pitch in your clinic or pitch in the, uh, or the emergency department. And then we, ha we have the advanced heart failure, the stage D, where there is marked heart failure symptoms, and this interfere with their daily life. They have recurrent hospitalization, despite being an optimal uh, guideline-directed medical therapy. So when we look at just stage C heart failure, okay, so those are the ones that will pitch in at the clinic or the emergency department. We have several categories. So one, we call them uh, a patient that is categorized as new onset or what we call de novo heart failure. So they have no diagnosis of heart failure previously. This is the first episode of heart failure. Then we have patients who have had heart failure in the past and then presents to you. We class them as acute decompensated heart failure. And if we have managed to bring them out of the decompensated state, they will have re resolution of symptoms and signs. Uh, very rarely, they will have a resolution of their previous and structural or functional heart disease. So we call them heart failure in remission now. So we follow the oncologist and we say that these are patients who are who have heart failure, but they are in remission. Uh, 
they are not previously we call these patients of stable heart failure but there's no stable state uh, they're always uh, on a volatile state whether they're going to go better or worse and then you have patients who despite started on medication they still have symptoms but their symptoms are controllable so these are patients that we call persistent heart failure and then we've got patients who are just going downhill with worsening symptoms worsening functional capacity then we call them worsening heart failure for this is just the stage c disease so when we start them on therapy uh, we hope that they improve so you might have a patient that which has have got half a ref reduce ejection fraction they may improve uh, but still remain in the half ref uh, category or they may improve and become the heart failure improved ef category we might have the heart failure with mild reduced ef so they may improve uh, and then you may call them uh, improved if they have ejection fraction of more than 50 but here the american guideline says that we don't actually know what is the correct trajectory and therefore they have maintain silence with this they do not call them improved and we have patients who are in the re mildly reduced who are now progressing to become refs totally to have an ejection fraction of 40 percent so we think that this re mildly reduced patients are a mix between either the the paths that are going down to refs or the refs that's going up to paths okay so they are in that category uh, and then of course we have the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or the half path patients, uh, they might suddenly reduce the ejection fraction and become a half ref, or they might just slip down slowly and become a half mildly reduced, or they maintain as a half pef. So there are all these trajectories that the, the patient can go through from one diagnosis uh, to, to another category of heart failure. Now, if we look at the guidelines, let's just concentrate on class one which are the patients who have risk factors but no heart failure symptoms, and the stage two, which is the pre-heart failure symptoms. What can we do for them? So uh, main things are, you know, if the patient is hypertensive, we can optimize their control of blood pressure. If they have diabetes, uh, we do that too. If they have cardiovascular disease, we optimally manage them. If they need revascularization, we offer them revascularization. If they're on cardiotoxic agents, uh, so with patients who are uh, having chemotherapy because of their uh, cancer, uh, we need to sometimes uh, have a multidisciplinary evaluation of the management. Uh, patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we have to do genetic screening and counseling uh, for their children and if they plan to get married. And of course, patients who are at high risk, uh, we are embarking myself and uh, ASA and UITM, we are embarking on this and looking at patients' naturactic peptide biomarkers and see whether uh, if it's starting to, to get high, uh, then we might uh, in, uh, you know, start them on some medication that can control uh, them progressing. In stage B, so these are patients with uh, ejection fraction that has been reduced, but they are asymptomatic. Again, so uh, we have all these drugs that we can use. So an ACE inhibitor, uh, an ARB, which is an angiotensin receptor blocker, a beta blocker, uh, and those patients who are uh, have an ejection fraction of less than 30% and have more than one year survival uh, and more than 40 days post-MI, we can even consider them on an ICD device, which is a defibrillator device inserted uh, to them. Uh, and uh, if they have uh, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, we can actually uh, give them genetic counseling for their kids and if they plan to get married. So all those 1111 stuff are just those uh, class one indications to use uh, those medications. Now we focus on chronic heart failure. The goals of treatment of patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is mainly to reduce mortality to prevent recurrent hospitalization due to worsening heart failure, and of course, to improve the clinical status, the functional capacity, and of course, the quality of life of the patient. So if we go to this first thing, so this is what has been recommended by the American guidelines. So step one is to establish the diagnosis of heart failure. So once we've done that, we, then we will initiate guideline-directed medical therapy. So here, they actually put ARNI, which is a new class of drug, which is called angiotensin receptor naprilysin inhibitor, or the other name is what we call secubitril valsartan, or the 
known name by everybody is Entresto. Uh, they recommend this uh, over the usage of the traditional ACE inhibitor and ARB in patients with NYHA class two to three. Uh, based on the paradigm study. Uh, there is a slight difference with the European guidelines regarding this. Uh, they recommend a beta blocker. So this is a, a guideline directed beta blocker. So we only recommend bisoprolol, carvedilol, and the uh, SR metoprolol, the sustained release metoprolol, uh, to be used in heart failure. MRA, which is a mineral mineralocorticoid antagonist, so this is uh, spironolactone. An SGLT2 inhibitor, I think my talk last year was uh, focusing on this new drug. Uh, uh, new kits on the block here, so these are drugs like tapaglifosin, empagliflozin, ertagliflozin, canagliflozin. Okay, and of course diuretics, because usually when they present to us, they are acutely congested, uh, and therefore we need to decongest them with giving them diuretics. And then the step two is that once we obtain an echocardiogram, we will uptiter the doses of these drugs to either the guideline dose recommended, which is the dose used in the trials, or we will uh, titer it up to what the patient can tolerate, okay? And then after that, we will then streamline them again and look at consider each patient's scenario. If they are African-American in origin, we will consider hydralazine nitrate combination. If they have ejection fraction of less than 35%, we can actually put in a, a cardio the defibrillator into them. And if they have a QRS complex on ECG of more than 150 milliseconds with a left bundle branch block pattern, they can even get cardiac resynchronization therapy if they remain asymptomatic. If they have uh, more episodes of admission and stuff, then we'll, we'll look at other uh, drugs. Uh, there are two another well-known new kits on the block. One is called Virisiguat, and the other one is called Omicantif Macabil. However, Virisiguat is actually uh, available in Malaysia, but Omicantif is not available at the moment. And then we will reevaluate the patient. And if they are refractory, we will refer them to a cardiology center like IJN, where they can actually uh, consider mechanical cardiorespiratory support, like an LVET or an RVET or both, uh, cardiac transplantation, although that is uh, a bit slow in this country. Or if we think that you no, know, we can't do much, then we will put them into a palliative program. So that's the thing. And what's important is that even if they remain asymptomatic after the initial treatment and they improve on their ejection fraction, we will not, we are not recommended to take off any of their medication that they have started. Okay, we have got a trial where the patients got better and we start to down tighter and these patients do badly on outcomes of mortality, morbidity and hospitalization. So we will remain them on the medication even though they are feeling much better. <clears throat> so if we look at the European guidelines, this was in the EHJ uh, or European Heart Journal in 2021. So again, they gave ACE inhibitor a class 1A, a beta blocker a class 1A, an MRA a class 1A. So remember the difference, if you look at the last one, they gave Sucubitril Valsatan recommendation of replacement of an ACE inhibitor to reduce risk of heart failure hospitalization, a 1B. Why they do that is just basically on some of the rules that they use, because this is only based on one study. There's only one uh, class, there's only one drug uh, at the moment in the market, and it's only one study. So uh, uh, we, they will not give an A recommendation on base of one study. Uh, and uh, the other thing is that uh, even though the Americans argue that because the 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 p value for this study was actually p equals to less than 0 0.0000001 so they said that because it's so significant do we need another study so that's why the americans have put it as an a level but the the european has maintained it as a b on basis that you need to have more than one trial uh, randomized control trial to, to to actually have an a in the guidelines and of course, uh, here, this is the capture valsatan 
de novo. That means the patients who are newly uh, diagnosed with heart failure, they actually gave it a 2BB, whereas in America, they actually still gave it a 1A class, okay? Because they say that based on the paradigm, but the paradigm is a chronic heart failure study, whereas based on the Pioneer HF study, which is the acute heart failure study, but however, the reduction in mortality and morbidity is actually just an explore, exploratory endpoint. It was not a pre-specified endpoint. So the Europeans, because of that, they were graded as 2BB. The Americans have said that, you know, they're gung-ho and they said, right, it is still a 1A. So it's exciting to see the Malaysian guidelines, uh, which is now being written, will be launched next year uh, to see what whether we're going to give it a 1B or whether we're going to give it a 1A. So it depends. However, one of the most important thing is that, one, the drug is available. Two, the accessibility of the drug because of cost issues, uh, because the month supply of the scriptural valsartan is uh, exorbitant. So these are the two trials, the paradigm, and which is looking at the ARNI, angiotensin monopolized inhibitor enalapril, in heart failure, uh, in, the, in patients with chronic heart failure. And this is the acute trial, which is Pioneer HF, uh, which actually 50% of the patients were de novo. Uh, so, but remember the endpoint, it was soft endpoints. They look at changes in BNP, they look at changes in quality of life, but they, they, the endpoint, the hard endpoints of mortality, morbidity, and heart failure hospitalization was just exploratory. Therefore, the Europeans still gave them a B indication. <laughs> And of course, dapaglifosin and ampaglifosin, uh, the SGLT2, they got a similar 1A recommendation, even in the European guidelines. So these are the two uh, heart failure uh, guidelines, uh, sorry, heart failure papers on looking at SGLT2. This is a diabetic drug, but uh, for heart failure, it is regardless, you will have a benefit of clinical outcome, whether you are diabetic or not diabetic, because only 45 to 50% of the patient involved were diabetics, the rest of them were non-diabetics, and they had similar outcomes. So uh, we're moving, this drug is moving from a diabetic drug going towards more of the uh, sort of cardio metabolic renal drug uh, now rather than a pure diabetes medication. So we have the four pillars, the ARNI, the beta blocker, the MRA, and the SGLT2. The Fruzmite is just for the congestive. Uh, the Europeans also have a, a phenotypic uh, sort of picture based on left bundle branch block, based on ischemia, based on presence of atrial fibrillation. So these are on add-on medication on top of the four blockbuster drugs of ARNI, BB, uh, beta blocker, MRA, SGLT2. Uh, for half uh, mildly reduced, again, so uh, diuretics, SGLT2 is up there for mildly reduced, uh, whereas ARNI, MRA, and evidence-based beta blocker have only got a 2B uh, 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 sort of level of evidence for patients with mildly reduced because, remember, these patients are wedged in between. So there's no specific uh, uh, randomized control trials that actually looked at this patient population. So that's why they do not have a class one, uh, uh, what do you call, class recommendation. Uh, the the uh, Europeans are also pretty similar in this. And for half half, uh, SGLT2 based on the uh, Emperor Preserve trial, which was actually presented the same time as the Ru European guidelines launch, uh, which was very positive in reduction of mortality, morbidity, and hospitalization. Uh, they actually got a 2A for patient uh, for uh, for FPF. However, for ARNI, MRA, and ARB, they have got actually a 2B because there are no clear trials or the, the trials that have looked at this specific. Uh, a group of patients have been quite neutral. The European, remember when I said that it was the same time the launch and the paper uh, of the Emperor Preserve was presented at the hotline session at the European Society of Cardiology meeting in Barcelona, I think last year. Uh, and therefore, uh, you know, so the, the guidelines was already 
uh, behind uh, you know, uh, as it was being published. So they actually didn't have any strong recommendation of level, and they all level C, uh, whereas the Americans gave Emperor, uh, base, as based on Emperor Preserve as JLT2 as level 2A. So what is out there in the real world? So we know that patients with heart failure have different presentation regarding the congestion, the hemodynamic status, and also the kidney function. And what we have to do is that we have got this list of medication, okay? But we need to adjust and actually prioritize the drugs according to the patient profile, okay? So we need to really go into a, a, a very individualized uh, approach to the patient. So we have to actually phenotype uh, the patients. So patient profiling is uh, a new thing that has come on. So we noticed that uh, patients with RAF, right, we'll use RAF here, okay, so they are rarely naive uh, with the pharmacological therapy. So they sometimes, they have hypertension, so they're already on an ACE inhibitor, or they have something else, they're already on a beta blocker. But, you know, they are very naive uh, of uh, these drugs, okay, so we just need to change. Uh, correctly prioritize and select the most appropriate titration schedule uh, across the patients that we see in our clinic. And unfortunately, some of them who are on this drug, when they come with an episode of hospitalization due to decompensation, uh, the doctor that sees them stop some of this medication. And then the restarting of this medication can be tricky in some. Uh, so uh, we, we advocate a more personalized approach uh, uh, to patient care. So the European Society has published this patient profiling, uh, which is what we call tailored medical therapy to the patient. So we have profiled the patient to based on four important categories, which is the heart rate, the blood pressure, whether there's evidence of atrial fibrillation, or whether there's uh, any ongoing uh, chronic kidney disease or hyperkalemia. Uh, so we have those four pillars, SGLT2 beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, ARB, ARNI, and MRA. So there's uh, the four, four sort of pillars. And then we have diuretics. We, that will handle the congestion, which is on the blue side, blue on the other side, okay? So when we profile them, uh, so this is what we see, what we have. So uh, you have the profiles or the combination that you can have. So there are nine distinct combination, okay? And the drugs are in the middle. And it will tell you what drugs are, uh, uh, you're supposed to start and see whether whether you need to reduce the dose or, or, or reduce uh, or increase the dose. So as you can see, SGLT2 is featured right at the top for all combination uh, of profiling. Okay, so uh, so a lot of people are now starting to use some of these uh, things to make sure that the correct patient with the correct profile gets the best therapy. And then the most important thing is that how should we start the treatment of REF? It's, you know, sometimes when we speak to general practitioners or we speak to junior consultants, you know, we have got these drugs, but how are they going to start this drug? So, so we have the foundational therapy, and then what happens is that there is a sequencing of up titration of the dosage uh, uh, of the drug. So what happens is that you start with one drug and then you up it to the maximum tolerable dose of that drug. And then you start with the second drug and then you up it, and then your third drug, you up it. And this will actually take six to 12 months to actually achieve. Uh, that is in, in, in the world that is not uh, Malaysia. So in Malaysia where, uh, you know, there is uh, the clinics are full uh, patient cannot come to clinic. Uh, there's some festival, therefore clinic is cancelled, and things like that. Patients are being pushed and pushed, and we realize that you know sometimes even one year to eighteen months after they have been diagnosed, they are still not uh, on medication that they are supposed to be at the correct dose or even the correct medication. Uh, this is also mirrored in the Western world. So they have done a lot of registries in the United States and in Europe, uh, where they find that you know the uptake of the medication is still low, even despite that we have all these guidelines. So, so this was the sequencing that was done prior. So you know you start the ACE and then you start the beta blocker and you start. So this will take around six weeks. Uh, this is another cartoon of how you do it. Okay, but this is one of the sequencing that we propose or that was proposed in one of the papers by John McMurray and Milton Packer. So what we do is we actually 
start the sequence, we start the patient on a beta blocker first and then SGLT2. This can only be done that the patient has already achieved a certain degree of clinical euvolemia. And then the next step is we introduce an ARNI, and then the next step we introduce an MRA. So if we do this, we can achieve all this medication in a matter of four to six weeks. So we must remember that the, the danger period from this charge is about a month. That's where they actually come in, come back in with a rehospitalization. So if we can upfront all their medication, all this guideline uh, derived medication early on, and then achieve a higher dose or achieve a maximum tolerable dose for this patient, we can achieve that in a matter of maybe two months or three months at most, rather than even 18 months down the line, the patient is still not uptighted because of certain uh, socio, psychological, economical issues. So this is another sequencing. Uh, that has been advocated, okay? So the, the thing now is that we have many sequences, as you can see, right? So we are now embarking on trials that look at which actually particular sequence actually does better because we are just sort of now, we know that they need to start on this drug, they need to be on a good dose of this drug as fast as possible and maintain on it. So, you know, so a lot of people can do a lot of combination uh, of however uh, uh, they see possible. Uh, and hence, this is some of the things that says, why is it important to maintain the patients uh, on guideline-directed therapy? So, you know, here with more increase in, in the usage of, of guideline therapy here, you realize that the mortality reduction is very, very significant. Just patients starting on a beta blocker, you have a biggest drop in mortality here. So that's why one of the, of the sequence that you see, they rate beta blocker as one of the starting agent and an SGLT2 because SGLT2 is one dose fits all. You just start on that dose, you don't have to up tighter. So you're done. Once you start on it, the patient tolerate, you're done. And a beta blocker is started first because it alone without anything else has the biggest reduction in mortality. So it's sensible to combine those both at the first stage, okay? And then you have your add-ons and the more add-ons of more of the guidelines data, the better the survival of the patient. And this is another main analysis that has looked at the best uh, reduction in CV mortality or heart failure hospitalization are patients who are on those big four pillars. You see, we have a greatest uh, reduction and CV mortality uh, in hospitalization and just CV mortality by itself. And uh, some fancy statistics was done with which they actually compared the what we call the comprehensive therapy, therefore starting these patients on drugs like ARNI, on drugs like uh, SGLT2 compared to the traditional ACE inhibitor ARB beta blocker. So even between the groups, okay, if we start them on the newer newer agents uh, compared to the older agents. So starting on the newer agents actually uh, increase their survival. So imagine if you are 65 years of age and starting on the comprehensive medication, we actually increase your survival by 6.3 years. In Malaysia, a lot of the heart failure are in the range of 55 to 60. In this group, if we start them even earlier on, the benefits of uh, uh, reduction in mortality or the extension of life survival uh, is actually about eight years to the patient. Uh, so, so first, start them early, start them young, get them on the correct dose as fast as possible and maintain them on that. Uh, this is just uh, another sort of the additional years that you get free of cardiovascular death and hospital admission of heart failure. So the earlier you start, so the Malaysia demography, demographic of Malaysians, which they actually present with heart failure at an earlier age compared to the West, will benefit if they go on the comprehensive therapy with the ARNI and the and the SGLT2, uh, uh, you know, instead of the old ACE inhibitor beta blockers, there's no new ones, so they stay the same. So these are some of the tricks where when we see the uh, doctors, uh, you know, we teach them because sometimes they say, oh, the blood pressure is low, oh, the heart rate is low, all this, you know, so what is it that we just need to do some fine tuning to the medication? We don't actually want you to take the patient off the medication. So if we can't get you on the maximum dose possible for all the medication, the second best option is actually to use lower doses of all drugs. And then higher dose of one and then you omit the other one 
we don't want you to do that. Okay, we want you to actually maintain a low dose, but all the four drugs, rather than say, oh, not tolerate this, so I just maintain him on a beta blocker. So they do less well than those that just have maintained on even a low baseline level, but all four medications. So that's what we advocate. So there are many factors of associated with non-optimal use of guideline medication, uh, medication in heart failure patients. Usually the doctors are afraid of tolerability issues. Patients are having low blood pressure, reduced heart rate, renal function, hyperkalemia, physicians inertia, they're not familiar with the drugs. Uh, they say that the patients are doing well anyway. So why do I want to change the medication? Uh, you know, so we have that, uh, even though we have evidence that say that if you change to better drugs, the patient would actually do better. Uh, but they say that they don't, they don't want to rock the boat, okay? There is limited access to specialist care. Uh, there we have a problem with organizational of care. There's, of course, poor socioeconomic status. Uh, lack of social support, because some of these, uh, you know, uh, we need the family to actually help out with us and bring the patient for follow-up and things like that. Sometimes uh, we we lack we are la lacking of that. And of course, poor understanding of the disease uh, by the patient itself, because the patient says, hey, I'm feeling better. No, my legs are not swelling up. You know, I can now climb the stairs. So uh, I have not taken the medication. So we need to actually empower our patients and actually make them understand about their disease and how the disease actually progress. Uh, we we try to help them with the medication, but we did not cure them uh, from their problems. So those are some of the things that uh, is holding us back from using the GDMT. So conclusion, uh, we need to start the guideline directed medical therapy as soon as possible. We have a guide on how to select which drug to start based on some degree of patient profiling. Uh, we have a guide on which combination and how to do it as fast as possible. Uh, and of course, we also understand that there are many factors that influence the use of a guideline directed medical therapy. And this happens at many levels, starting from the patient to the caregiver and the healthcare policies. Okay, thank you very much and good luck. And I'll be taking some questions. Any Thank you questions? so much, uh, Prof. Rahal, for your very informative uh, information on the updates of the guidelines, which which helps the health professionals uh, manage people with heart failure. And I think uh, you've shown a lot of uh, evidence-based recommendations. Thank you so much for that. And I think we'll just look into the questions. Uh, okay. I think we have a few questions here, Prof. Uh, okay. The first question is from Prof. Razif Ali. Uh, Prof. Rasif is asking, I wonder if patients with controlled heart failure, that's with uh, beta blockers, mm -hmm. can participate in low-level aerobics, such as brisk walking for 20 minutes, three or four times a week? Okay. So, I mean, uh, thank you for the question. So, yes, uh, the answer is we encourage them to actually uh, exercise regularly. Uh, the guidelines actually recommend 150 minutes per week. Uh, you can divide them in sort of just a moderate level uh, of met uh, uh, between 4.5 to 6 also so they just break off in a in a sweat uh, and yes you can do that uh, uh, with a beta blocker on board as well okay it's just that their heart rate uh, will not increase you know so that's that's good uh, in a way okay but as long as <clears throat> the heart rate will increase but it will not be going to 100 or 120 or 140 150 so uh, uh, that's what we want uh, them uh, to do okay so yes there is no harm in exercising we recommend exercising even if they are on the guideline directed medical therapy uh, you can go uh, recommend it is 150 minutes uh, per week you can even go more than that uh, at the end of the day, you have to strike a deal with the patient. The patient knows what's best for them. I've actually got a heart failure patients that uh, that actually uh, went on a cancer walk, uh, which is a five kilometer walk. And he actually did better than me. We both went on, on it. It's a virtual walk. Uh, and his time was actually better than mine. So I was like, amazing, that's good. Uh, you know. So I, I think, yes, we definitely recommend exercise. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. So another question from Prof. Arifin. 
So he says, um, Pete's data and studies on heart failure are limited. Uh, so heart failure treatment in PEDS is based on adult studies and guidelines. Does yes. AHA make a special category for PEDS in the current guidelines? Okay, so there is no specific <clears throat> specific heart failure guidelines in the pediatric population. The pediatric population has a, a, a guideline based on uh, a pediatric cardiology and one of the subsections of that is actually heart failure but i know because you know it has it's going malaysia is revising the the their cpg the malaysian cpg the last cpg has actually an, a, a section on pediatrics which was done uh, by uh, dr nizam from jb and dr haifa from ijn so uh, there is some guide there uh, whereas the new guidelines that's going to be that's currently being written i i'm one of the people in the committee we have actually actually divorce uh, the pediatric section out because we think that the pediatric section should have a standalone session and Dr. Ita Kandavalo from uh, Institute Jantung Negara is going to actually spearhead uh, that particular uh, guideline as a separate guideline rather than joining it with the adults because when you joined it with the adults the pediatric doctors think that oh it's an adult guideline but actually in the, the last guide as well the current guidelines for Malaysia there is actually a section uh, just on pediatrics thank you thank you Prof. so the next question uh, from Prof Minsoy uh, he's just asking is there any role of uh, digoxin in the treatment of heart failure uh, okay, so digoxin has it's one of the one of the first few heart failure medication uh, due to the foxglove uh, uh, thing, uh, you know, flower. Sorry, so uh, uh, it has been used uh, for a very long time. Uh, however, we realized that due to its narrow therapeutic index uh, and patients are not familiar how to use it, uh, therefore, a lot of the time it receives bad press. There is one study, which is uh, the only study that has looked at uh, DIG, uh, which is called the DIG trial, which was done in the 1990s. And that only shows that starting patients on digoxin therapy does not reduce heart outcomes of mortality, but it does reduce heart failure hospitalization. So in those patients who you have started on this therapy, and they are still what we call frequent flyers, you know, so frequent flyer, you know, you're always flying from right, left and center around the globe. So you get frequent flyer miles, right? So we call them frequent flyers. So they come in every two, three weeks because of a hospitalization. So in these patients, then we might consider starting them on digoxin in a controlled manner, okay? Because uh, it does reduce hospitalization, but it does not reduce mortality. Okay, so we, we do start them, but we will start them from the lowest dose. And of course, we need to actually measure the digoxin level. So that's where it gets a bit tricky. So we need to measure a trough level, and the trough level has to be less than 0 0.9. And there's also a gender difference in the level. So people that use it must first be equipped with the knowledge of how to use it. So that's why it's not a main feature. It's more of a site feature in the trial. Okay, uh, in the in the guidelines. Thank you, thank you, Prof. Uh, another question from uh, Prof. Jaydeep Nanda: Has there been any change for the heart disease with pregnancy? Uh, he says um, at present we use the NYHA classification. Mm. Yeah, I think it's still the same. Uh, uh, the uh, pregnancy disease uh, uh, guidelines are going to be. Uh, reviewed in about two to three years time. I'm also in the panel of the writing committee for the pregnancy uh, guidelines. Uh, at the moment, we will still use the NYJ class. Uh, and I recommend the pregnancy guidelines uh, that we have written because uh, it really uh, took us a long time working with uh, obstetrician. Uh, we worked with Dato Ravi at that time, not the Dato Ravi that is the uh, that was from Massa, but the Dato Ravi from JB who's the current service head. And we came up with a quite a nice uh, uh, algorithm and things like that. So, but the, the way you still use NYHA and that is not due to be uh, rewritten. 
uh, for another two to three years. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. And uh, Prof. Razib, just thanking you for your explanation. Okay. You're welcome. There's one, one last question, Prof. Is it okay for you to take up this? Yes, yes. Can yes yeah. Uh, yeah. Is it, it is from um, Associate Professor Dr. Nilar Kin. Uh, she's asking, when will you consider palliative treatment in heart failure patients? What are the palliative treatment in these patients? Okay. All right. Okay. So that is a very, uh, you know, palliative care is always a new uh, new realm altogether. So, so we will uh, think about it when they're in stage D disease. Therefore, uh, they have really, we have thrown the book at them, you know, and either they are, they cannot tolerate the drugs or, or, or they're still coming in as a frequent flyer. Uh, they have very bad quality of life. Remember, there's three options. One of them is actually to use a mechanical circulatory support uh, in the form of LBAT. Uh, uh, if they have in, they are in hospital, uh, we can use ECMO. Uh, and there's AV ECMO, VV ECMO, and all those kind of things. Uh, they all have cost issues and other issues because you have to be in hospital. Therefore, we'll try to uh, start you on LVAT and see whether we can discharge you. Now, uh, LVAT's uh, left ventricular assisted device are actually destination therapy. Previously, it was a bridge therapy to transplantation. But now we've decided that maybe uh, that we are using it as destination therapy. So the patient's walking around with tubes in their heart. The heart is not functioning. They have a pump that is replacing the, the heart uh, to pump blood all over their body. Uh, because transplantation uh, is, rates are very low in this country uh, due to either increase, reduce in awareness or reduce in organ don donors and things like that. So <clears throat> if we think that they are not candidates for transplantation and they have uh, issues with LVAT, then we will actually have a case conference with the family and actually discuss on, uh, you know, at that point in time, I mean, your survival. Can't, well, don't be surprised that the survival rates of heart failure is actually worse than some cancers. I think only lung cancer actually supersedes us. So 50% will actually die in about three to five years from heart failure. So it doesn't uh, doesn't look good, okay, right? Uh, so then we will offer palliative care. So some centers have got palliative care consultants, uh, you know, that are looking into this. So end of life care, you know, things like, you know, yes, we'll keep you comfortable. Uh, we can start you on a pump, uh, things like that. Uh, you know, where do you want to die? We, we, we bring out the issues of where you want to die, how do you want to die, you know, this kind of things. Are uh, there counselors that, that handles this, uh, you know, uh, all, all this kind of things. So uh, it's, a, it's an area that is growing. Uh, I I know it exists. I've got friends who does uh, a lot of the palliative care treatment for these patients. I myself, uh, I actually refer to them. So personally, uh, I do not have first-hand uh, uh, experience on managing them, but I know certain people that do. And the patients are actually, you know, because they actually uh, got what they want. You know, that's what they want. At the end of the day, you know, we do this and this and this, and at the end of the day, we have to step back and look and see whether are we doing the correct stuff for this patient. What actually does the patient want? You know, sometimes they're just fed up. They said, no, I don't have life. Every two days I go back. On my third day, I'm back in the hospital. You know, and then I go back and then I come back. You know, what, what is life in that, uh, in that sort of spectrum of, for that patient? So that's where, and then when we actually talk to them and say that, okay, what do you want? You know, do you want that you have another decompensation? You want to stay at home? We'll get a nurse to go and see you <clears throat> and just tweak your, your your medication and just keep you comfortable. And a lot of them are very happy uh, with that and, and they go along with that. And some, I've got a few patients who are actually still alive and doing well. Uh, when I've referred them and I was, you know, when you refer, you're like, I probably won't see the patient again, right? So, but then like two months down the line, you go like, hey, you're still here. Well done. You know, you, uh, you pull through. At the end of the day, you know, we are doctors. We, we are not God. So taking lives belongs to God, not us. Thank you, Prof. And uh, another question from Prof. Van Arifin. Uh, where does heart failure rank as cause of death in Malaysia compared with other countries? Okay. So um, we don't, uh, at the moment, the data is being collected at the CRC uh, or NIH for this. Uh, 
uh, we have cardiovascular disease as the number one cause of death. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know whether it has been superseded by COVID. Uh, you know, so uh, cardiovascular disease is still the number one cause of death in Malaysia. Uh, in the world, uh, it's still either ranked number one or number two. So heart failure per se, uh, we don't have the data for Malaysia uh, regarding that. We have ischemic heart disease, uh, which is also very high. Uh, so if you think about the, you know, the heart uh, CV disease is number one, and the number one of that is actually ischemic heart disease, so coronary disease. Uh, but we don't have per se the data that, that is on just on heart failure by itself. Thank you. Thank you so much for all, all your time, Prof. You've been answering a lot of questions here. Thank you and hope to have you in another CME event soon. Thank you so much. Okay, for thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay, bye. So with that, we come to an end of our CME, uh, 88 CME today, and hope to have you all soon again. I think our next CME will be on the 6th of uh, May. So until then, all of you take care and uh, see you all again in another CME event. Thank you.